But yeah, we weaponize the dollar. The reaction from Russia and China and Saudi Arabia and Latin America is we're going we're gonna to go to something else to store our value. The Bank of International Settlements is recognizing that. The IMF is recognizing that. And so, yeah, we're defending against a weaponized dollar by building a moat of physical gold. Because we see where the pocky, the, as Wayne Gretzky would say, the hockey puck is going, not where it's sitting. I say the polo ball because I like polo, but it's a wanker sport. The point is, the truth is, the, the, the bricks and the rest of the world are playing where the ball is headed, not where it's sitting right now. The U.S. dollar is sitting, quote unquote, pretty right now, but gold is the direction it's going. And so it is being weaponized, Kai, in a lot of ways, as a defense, not as an aggression. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host for this channel. Really looking forward to, to the uh, discussion we have lined up today for you with a returning guest, Matthew Piepenberg. He's a partner over at Frank Rice Gold and somebody I really enjoyed talking with. He's got a great overview of what's happening in the markets, a bit of a historian as well, so I always like, throw, uh, like, always like him throwing some, some historical tidbits into the conversation and drawing some comparisons as well. We have lots to talk about. Last time we chatted was in January at the Vancouver Resource Investment conference. We hosted a roundtable together with Rick Rule. But so much has happened, especially just in the last five days here in the markets, that we probably need the full hour to catch up on things and see where we're at. Really looking forward to this. But uh, before I switch over to my guest, quick reminder, hit that like and subscribe button, follow us, leave a comment and uh, leave a like. It helps us out tremendously. Thank you so much. Now, without much further ado, Matthew, it is great to see you again. Thanks so much for making the time. Okay, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, as I said, we have lots to talk about. The S&P had the best and the worst day uh, since 2022, just in the last five days or four days, actually, because we were recording before market open on Friday. So uh, mm -hmm. it has been an extremely volatile week. Lots been going on. Let, let's start with an all encompassing question here. And uh, instead of my general question is like, I'm going to ask you, how nervous are the financial markets right now, Matthew? Well, it depends on how informed financial markets are. It depends on if their heads are in the sand or if they want to believe the sweet little lies of deficits without tears and markets that only go up. And again, that sounds sensational. This this Black Monday of August 5th and the, and the, and the bloodletting that we saw in the Japanese carry trade in some ways reminded me when I was in high school of the 87 flash crash. It was the what was fascinating about the losses on that day was the Lazarus-like re renaissance of the markets the next day when Greenspan just uh, unlet let out all this liquidity and rate cuts. And already we're seeing a similar rebound from the massive volatility we saw at the beginning of this week from, from the volatility that Pebble affected or Ripple affected from the, from the interest rate hike in Japan. And suddenly markets are rebounding because Japan is gonna hold back on, on further rate hikes and strengthening the yen. So it really depends, Kai, on, on how much time can be bought by postponing the inevitable. And, and again, no one could time a crisis that's already in play, it's just how much liquidity the markets and, and, the, and the central banks can cooperate and demand from each other with their currencies and their interest rate policies. I look at it a lot like, you know, I reminded myself when I was in college or take any college student or frankly, any middle-class American now just playing, playing cards with their Visa or MasterCard and Amex to get through the month. You can, depending on the credit limit, you could keep buying time and leveraging through more and more fake money or debt to stay alive. But at some point, at some point, the, you know, the proverbial X hits the fan. And what we're doing now, and we can get into more detail, is just postponing that, finding more and more ways to get direct QE or backdoor QE or more liquidity or more regulatory changes to try and buy time to postpone the inevitable consequences of far, far too much debt and far, far too much currency destruction and interest rate manipulation. And we can play this game, but the end result to me is inflationary. The end result to me is with a de disinflationary, massive deflationary market correction in the interim. But the, the end result is the, ultimately the same. Uh, we're going to monetize our way out of this crisis or we're going to fight our way out of this crisis in some type of war, which makes very little sense to me in the 21st century in a nuclear era. But uh, the drum, the war drums are beating just about everywhere. So there's a lot of th threads to pull, Kai. Uh, but uh, we should be very nervous. Everyone will say, well, you know, you gold bugs in Switzerland are always gloom and doom. But the evidence is overwhelmingly gloomy. It's not sensational anymore. It's realistic. It's just how many more band-aids we can put on these knife wounds, how much more uh, false or fake or backdoor liquidity we can put in to buy time, how much more central bank coordination works until it doesn't. And I think when we talk about the Japanese carry trade, which I'm sure we will a little, we have to also talk about the dollar carry trade and how risky that is. And at some point, this whole 
you know, game of musical chairs with buying time with 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 mouse click money eventually or backdoor liquidity eventually implodes. And no one can time it. You can just see the signals that's happening. And what we saw this week is just another symptom of all these different needles pointing at this massive global debt balloon. The Japanese carry trade was one needle. There's many other needles pointed at it. And uh, we can just watch. But if you look at the way the risk assets reacted in 24 hours, how vulnerable they were from the Nikkei 225 to the Nasdaq 200 to the Japanese banks to Bitcoin, et cetera, or AI and semis, they just tanked beautifully as expected. And uh, gold held its nose above water far better. There's only going to be one winner, and that's not the only winner, but I think uh, I think gold has just shown, as we can get into in more detail, that it's the most resilient asset right now and the most protective in a world just riddled with risk. All right. Pardon the interruption. We've got inflation and interest rates likely sticking around for the summer, at least. So I want to talk about this article from Goldman Sachs that's aged like fine wine. It was published almost exactly two years ago when inflation really started cutting through our earnings. Goldman focuses this piece entirely on real assets and protecting your purchasing power with special emphasis on gold. And in the same sentence where they specifically name precious metals, Goldman brings up another exciting real asset, fine art. It may sound surprising until you consider the billionaires who sit on nine-figure-plus art collections, like Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen or hedge fund billionaire Steve Cohn and Ken Griffin. In fact, the overall art and collectibles asset class is estimated at nearly $2.2 trillion by Deloitte and is expected to hit almost $2.9 trillion in 2026, leaving lots of room for potential upside. That's why you should check out today's sponsor, Masterworks. While you're still early to the scene, their art investing platform has already distributed back a total of over $60 million in investor proceeds across 23 exits. And you don't need to be an art expert to get involved. You also don't need to throw in millions of dollars and can diversify between multiple paintings. Because Masterworks' art investing platform offers blue chip paintings to investors in the form of shares. Some of Masterworks' previous offerings include legendary artists like Picasso, Basquiat, and Banksy. And they're nearing over $1 billion of invested capital, so offerings have the potential to sell out rather quickly. So if you're interested in learning more and want priority access, you can use QR code on the screen now or use the link in my description below. Past sales of previous offering demand are not indicative of future results, and all investing, of course, involves risk. See important regulation A disclosures at masterworks.com slash CD. Now, let's get on with the interview. Oh, 100 percent. 100 percent. You mentioned so many topics we need to follow yeah. up on. Geopolitics, of course, is a big mm -hmm. one. Uh, mm -hmm. Iran uh, clearing its airspace over the, overnight yeah. uh, here as well. A uh, big yeah. precursor of might, what might be coming down the pipeline here, sadly. Um, mm -hmm. But let, let's stay on the events for this week. Um, I've yeah. seen a lot of memes on X, for example, where people are like, okay, was it the Yen Carry trade? And mm -hmm. you, you might have seen the David Beckham meme. Like, was it the Yen Carry trade? <laughs> be, be, be honest. Was it the tech bubble imploding? Be honest. Right. Like nobody, nobody really knows what really triggered right. the. Like it's a meme. Like I'm, yeah. I'm sure there's some reasons at play. Like, but let's work out a bit more where the volatility sure. came from and how mm -hmm. high that fear index is right now. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I mean, look, in, in 30 seconds, the you know this carry trade story. Well, Japan and the yen have been a global prop desk for uh, you know liquidity uh, via rate and uh, currency arbitrage. And the simple fact is you could, when, with Japan having massive deflation rather than inflation, their rates were pretty much zero to nothing. Um, and so anyone in the shadow banking system, the hedge fund system could borrow yen, convert it to dollars and buy tech and then add on three or four turns of leverage. And that system works fantastic. As long as the yen doesn't get stronger, it, rates don't go up and tech stocks don't go down. And what we saw this week is be careful what you know. Be careful what you assume. Those are very dangerous drunk driving assumptions to assume that the yen couldn't get stronger, rates couldn't go higher. The Bank of Japan raised rates in March and then again in August uh, by 15 basis points. And look at the world just panic because liquidity was suddenly expensive. And so again, that string side of disasters in 24 hours was just a symptom of how fragile these markets are. I think what's most overlooked though isn't the Japanese carry trade or how the world needed a cheap yen and a low rate yen to survive and provide liquidity because everything is about liquidity. The far more dangerous carry trade that very few people are talking about is the US dollar carry trade. If the US dollar gets too strong, you've got what, 57 trillion net international investment positions in other countries or other nations outside of the US dollar who, who have US dollar assets and 13 trillion in bonds. If the US dollar becomes too strong, that's dangerous. But far more importantly, in the banking system, in the Euro dollar system, that's all the banks outside of the US that are transacting in US dollars and who are buying derivatives and need collateral. 
if the U.S. dollar becomes too strong, not looking at J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs or Citibank, who can go direct to the Fed and get cheap U.S. treasuries for collateral, but these outside of the U.S. dollar, U.S. Uh, zip code, those banks like UBS or the revived Credit Suisse or HBSC or anything, uh, or Deutsche Bank or Dresdner Bank, if they want to get um, treasuries as collateral, T-bills as collateral, they have to go into the open market. If the dollar is too strong, those euro dollar banks have to either tighten their balance sheets or eventually default on their loans. And then we have a banking crisis far bigger than 2008 that starts on the other side of the Atlantic, not in Wall Street. The point is, Weak yen, weak dollar, strong yen, strong dollar. These things have massive ripple effects that these grotesquely, as Jeremy Grant would say, shockingly overvalued markets simply can't stomach. So it's just a question of what's the next needle going to be. Last week, it was the yen getting too strong. If the dollar gets too strong, then we have a dollar carry trade crisis in the euro dollar markets and the derivative markets and in the NIP and then net international investment positions. So it's just it's a bug looking for a windshield these risk assets that again i'm a gold guy but i used to run a hedge fund during the dot-com bubble i've seen bubbles i saw the gfc bubble not all of it was obvious but it was pretty freaking obvious and what i'm seeing today is is far more obvious and we just need a mean reversion or we can prevent a mean reversion by monetizing the markets nationalizing them with fake liquidity and killing the currency it's one or the other or both so we've seen just how fragile things are, what it takes, a little overnight event, and you wake up the next morning and the VIX is spiking beyond all measures. I think what's really important right now when you're looking at the markets, and again, not a gold bug guy, look at Jeremy Grantham, certainly understands risk assets. Look at Warren Buffett, he understands stocks. He went $200 billion to cash before this happened. He took 50% off his Apple position. <clears throat> look at Jeffrey Gunlack, these bond experts. They're all saying that this bond market is, is, is marching towards implosion and the risk assets like equities are grotesquely overvalued. But I think, I think the bigger thing that scares me now, unlike even the great financial crisis of 2008, which I remember intimately trading, the risk levels are far worse today than they were in 2008. Uh, the VIX spikes are higher than they were in 2008. The market cap to GDP in 2008 was 1.3. Today, it's 2x. Cash levels today are at eleven percent. Even in 08, they were at fifteen percent. And you know, in the same time, we've got China and now Germany in recession. So it's a global macro event. So we're buying time. We are picking up dimes and quarters in front of three or four different moving trains. So yeah, your, your question: How's the mood in the markets? It depends on how informed you are, how, how how concerned you are about protecting rather than going further and further out on that risk branch for some kind of yield or return. And by the way, measuring that return in a currency that's consistently daily getting more and more debased by inflation. So it's an insanely crazy world right now. You don't have to be gold bug, gloom and doom or negative on the macros. You could be Jeremy Grantham. You could be Jeffrey Gunlack. You could be Ray Dalio. You could be Elon Musk. Again, this is no longer some niche little corner that looks at macro risk with, with open eyes. The, the world is catching on. But again, don't underestimate human nature. They'll still believe this time is different. They can get more return. Rates are going to come down. Markets are going to rip. It is a market. You know, The S&P is led by 20% market cap is led by a few names. The NASDAQ, 50% is led by 10 names. It is such a narrow market. And the only thing that's going to keep it alive is eventually going to be more, more liquidity in some form. That doesn't have to be just direct QE. That can come from supplementary leverage ratios. That can come from the short end of the repo market or the yield curve from the Treasury General account, from bank regulations that are now allowing you know funds to have lower capital rates that can buy more junk bonds. By the way, junk bond spreads are, are widening. Every indicator I look at, this market is far more poised for disaster than 2008 or the NASDAQ in, in 99, 2000 or 2001. So yeah. I mean, if you're informed, your mood should be far more protective than, than speculative right now. Uh, but it's fascinating how I'll stay now and I'll stay sin. Out of sight, out of mind. Just put your head in the sand. You know, it's all going to be fine. The Fed has your back. The central banks have your back. The truth is all the central banks are cornered right now. Yeah, 100%. Like there's a very little wiggle room. Um, mm -hmm. Really, real quick on the Japanese yen. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was all triggered sort of by the Bank of Japan saying we're going to increase rates to 0.25%. You know, mm -hmm. still in comparison, a very low number, but of course, yeah. historically, if, you, if you're familiar with Jap uh, Japan, uh, yeah. a higher funds rate or yeah. uh, a Japanese funds rate. But the question is, I have now is like they, they walked their statement back. It's like we're not going to raise now. The market has told us not to raise rates. Um, yeah. Was it really just the market telling them not to?
to raise rates? Like, if you were to speculate, how did that come about? Like, somebody must have called up the the president of the bank of Japan. Is like, dude, you can't do this. Well, I, I mean, I'm speculating myself, but I'm not. I have no illusions about the communications between the Fed and the BOJ. In, in many ways, you could argue because the Fed doesn't want to admit defeat on the war against inflation, and they're looking for liquidity. Like I said, I think Japan in some ways had tacit approval from Powell to say, look, keep your rates low, man. This is liquidity. It's good for you. It's good for us. Your investors, our investors gives us liquidity. That prop desk for arbitrage on currencies and rates is great. Keeping the markets alive, bringing liquidity into the markets. I think there was some tacit approval to do that. But at some point, Japan is cornered. They need to support their yen. They need to support their own bond markets. They raised rates a little to support their yen. And, and look what happened. The world couldn't handle it. U.S. markets couldn't handle it. And I wouldn't be surprised, and I'm only speculating, that if someone from you know the Eccles building called up the Bank of Japan and said, man, you got to walk it back, that's that's how fragile these markets are. That's how desperate for liquidity we are. If you, if you raised BIPs, if you raised 15 BIPs in August, the world goes into a tizzy. And so, of course, they, they walked it back. I can't tell how coordinated that would be but between the BIS, the Fed, and the Bank of Japan. It wouldn't surprise me if there was a few phone calls. Like, whoa. Yeah. But again, they're trying to manage a ship with 50 different holes in its bow. And they're just trying to put their finger in one hole and, and caulk in the other and a bandaid over the next. And they're doing a magnificent job of buying time and spreading the message of Be Calm, Carry On. Well, you know, they're, they're, they're clearly not stupid. Uh, they've got to see the end is coming. But what they'll do, because central bankers are like any politician, they'll never take accountability ever for making a mistake. They'll never be wrong. And when things do implode, they'll blame it on, as I've said a thousand times, COVID, the debt crisis that COVID created. They'll blame it on global warming. They'll blame it, they'll blame it on Putin and the wars, and they'll blame it on some other third party, or they'll blame it on little green men from Mars that are making the headlines. So they'll never just say, boy, we have been living beyond our means in debt as a country, and we've been monetizing that as a central bank. And uh, we're going to pay the piper, but we're going to blame it on something else. And in the meantime, we'll keep churning and churning uh, liquidity in some form, whether it's direct QE or some other form. And in some ways, the Jap carry trade, the Japanese carry trade was an indirect form of QE. It was a form of liquidity, uh, particularly for the U.S. markets and for Japanese and Western investors, because the Japanese net international investment position is positive. Their, their piggy bank is in the U.S. markets and tech. And these tech stocks, I'm sorry, I've seen this movie before. Uh, when their net income margins go from north to south, that's the end of the game. And in a narrow market like this, you can't afford to see NVIDIA or these other magnificent three, not even the magnificent seven, go, go down so fast. But look what they did on one rate hike in Japan. They tanked marvelously and then rebound like we saw in 87 marvelously within 24 hours because of policies. But that's just buying time, Kai. Yeah, like Matthew, I'm I'm a bit uh, conflicted. Like, where should we take the conversation? Because I want to stay on the Fed and talk about like whether they're behind the curve yeah. and yeah. Uh, in their with their, in the current rate environment. But also, you brought yeah. up sort of quality earnings of the companies. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll stay on the on the Fed for now. Like, I want to yeah. talk about that. Uh, yeah. I watched a David Rosenberg interview on Bloomberg yesterday, and he says we should be at four percent. The mm -hmm. question now to you, Matthew, is, is the Fed behind the curve? Well, the Fed is trapped. <clears throat> the most important thing you have. I mean, there's there's the there is the psychology, the human, all too human Nietzschean quote there about human vanity and human legacy and how one or two individuals can have an impact on millions of individuals. Uh, on the rate hike side, the argument for going higher for longer and staying at this uh, to fight inflation, you know, Powell, again, doesn't want to go down as the next Arthur Burns and get out too soon. But I think he's more afraid of making the Volcker mistake of 1980 when they thought they'd beaten inflation enough. And then they reduced rates, uh, Volcker reduced rates, and then within a matter of days, inflation spiked you know, by 8%. I think Powell is really trying not to be the guy who didn't beat inflation. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, you said I'd like to use history as an example. Powell's war on inflation, by the way, will end up being inflationary because if he keeps rates higher for longer, the interest expense on our debt goes from 1.6 to 1.7 trillion annually. We don't have the GDP and tax receipts to pay for that. So we'll actually have to use QE or some form of direct liquidity to monetize our own interest expense. That's the fiscal dominance argument that Lou Groman and the St. Louis Fed have made very clear. But I think Powell's, he reminds me a lot of uh, Napoleon. You know, Napoleon, it, it, not at Waterloo, but Napoleon, when he marched into Russia after the Battle of Borodino and defeated the Tsar's army and then marched into Moscow and Moscow was in flames. But he did get Moscow. Napoleon did get Moscow. But he went into Russia with about 400,000 soldiers and came out with 10,000. So he won the battle but lost the war. 
I think it's very similar with Powell trying to beat inflation. It's going to be his Moscow moment, his his great victory and massive loss, because to beat inflation, he has to basically kill demand, create a recession. That's very disinflationary. That's on the back of the citizen soldiers of the U.S. because he's killing the middle class. Bankruptcies are, you know, all time highs in, in the last four years, 35 percent rise over year over year. So he's killing the middle class. He's killing demand to fight inflation. So he may, quote unquote, get close to two percent. He won't stay there like, you know, Napoleon got to Moscow, but he won't stay there. He'll march back and the bloodletting will be immense. So his victory is very pyrrhic. So Powell could raise rates to avoid an Arthur Burns moment or a Volcker mistake, but he'll crush everything in the meantime. And then when everything's crushed, we're going to have to go to QE to the moon and liquidity to the moon to save it. So he, he can't win either way. Yeah, we should be at 4%. But if we go to 4%, he's going to have to admit defeat on the war against inflation. If we brought rates to 4%, as Rosenberg said, which I understand, he's admitting that they can't beat inflation and that they're going to have to debase the dollar. And that means the policy that the Fed's quote unquote mandates are supposed to be inflation and employment. They're failing on both. But that would mean Powell has to admit that he, he lost. And at a human level, I don't think he's willing to do that yet. I don't think he's stupid. I do think he has good intentions, but he can't admit he's wrong. He can't admit he's trapped. And so he's going to be like Napoleon. He'll get Moscow. Maybe he'll he'll bring inflation down, but he won't defeat it. And he doesn't want to admit that, that he's trapped. And we're going to have to at some point, because I think all the inflation arguments aside, the interest expense on Uncle Sam's bar tab, his debt, is unpayable. And so we have to reduce rates to pay for our own interest expense. It's our biggest budget outlay right now. And I can't predict when, because now we're predicting what Powell's going to do. He's looking more and more nervous at every FOMC meeting. He's looking more and more constrained to try and come up with the right magical words. Uh, when, you know, the market's priced in, when we met in Vancouver, they were talking about six rate hikes this year. I said, I don't see six rate hikes. I see the markets going up just on the promise of rate, I mean, excuse, of rate cuts. cuts. Cuts, excuse me. I see the markets getting super galvanic and excited, like greedy little kids, about the idea of more candy, more chocolate. But it didn't happen. It hasn't happened yet. Will it happen in September? The truth is, I don't know, because I don't know what Powell's going to do. What's his psychology? He has to at some point. Is he waiting uh, for something to happen? I mean, Thomas Hernig, who was another Fed official, one of the very few who I actually respect, who's actually very honest. Thomas Hernig was very, very much against Powell and, and, and Bernanke when he was there. He was one of the few FOMC members who kept throwing out a veto because Thomas Hernig was taught when he came into this, into the into the FOMC. Uh, I think it was the Kansas City Fed when he became president there. His mentor said, when you make policies, make them for the long term. Let the short term figure itself out. But what Bernanke and Yellen, et cetera, and Powell have done is the exact opposite. They do everything for the short term, long term be damned, because every dip is a crisis. Every market crisis is an opportunity for the Fed to create more liquidity. That's bought short term, short term prosperity. It's going to bring permanent ruin. And I think I think Hernig is right that, you know, we are in we are just one banking crisis away from more direct QE and everything. We remember 2008. We just saw what happened in August this month in, in Japan. Usually the behind the scenes of every disaster is a banker with his head down trying to avoid the press. And that includes commercial banks and central banks. But, you know, Thomas Hernig said he's very, very afraid of the banking system in America. And this kind of drifts into central banking to commercial banking. And he's a former bank regulator, FDIC guy, before he was a Fed president. He understands banking risk. So the banking system is probably has a score of three on a scale from one to 10. It sees, it's got 600 billion in unrealized losses in their government securities and trillions in other losses due to higher rates, which, are, which need repricing. The major example of that is commercial real estate. Those are non-performing loans. So they say, and Hernig understands banks, he's more honest, he's much more honest and direct than Powell. He's like, look, the, the bankers say, the Fed says, and the, cent and the commercial banks say they're well capitalized. And, you know, because of risk weighted capital at 14 percent. Hernig is saying that's just a lie. It's just a lie because the real the real measure is capital to total assets, which for the big banks now is about 7 percent. So if there's a 4 percent correction, those big banks face real default risk. That's not an exaggeration, again, from a gold bug in Zurich. That's Thomas Hernig, president of the Kansas City Fed former bank experts saying these banks are fragile. So again, it's all about liquidity. It's all about leverage. It's all about being over their skis in debt and unprepared. So if to your original question, <clears throat> to Rosenberg's point, we bring rates down to 4%, we're going to need to, to, to pay our debts. Um, but that doesn't erase all the other problems. But yes, we're going to need to, to avoid defaults on CRE. We're going to need to avoid defaults at the bond and corporate level. There are 740 billion worth of bonds that need to be repriced this year at higher for longer. There's 1.2 million 
bonds that need to be priced next year at you know higher for longer. If we don't bring rates down, we're gonna we're gonna engineer not just a recession but a potential major financial crisis and banking crisis. So the Fed is absolutely trapped. They can they can buy time. They can manipulate rates, give some short term tailwinds to equities. We'll see. I'd be very curious to see. Uh, because the markets have priced in this rate, these rate cuts for so long that when they actually come, I wonder how much juice they're going to get out of it. But when, when the party's over and the rate hikes are done, we still face too much debt. We still have too many zombie corporations. We still have too many, uh, you know, uh, too, too wide a spreads in the junk bond markets. I don't see an easy long-term solution. But to Hernick's point, the Fed is only short-term thinking. And this is Hemingway's famous quote, you know, you can buy temporary prosperity, but you're going to have permanent ruin through the debasement of the currency, inflation and war. And what we're seeing all around us, either literally, directly, proxy or indirect, is war and inflation. And a rate cut's not going to stop that now. It's not going to stop this ball moving. It can't stop the $35 trillion in public debt, government debt in the U.S. It can't stop the 120% deficit of the GDP. It can't stop the fact that we have a 6% deficit to GDP ratio. It can't stop the fact that in the, it took us... 220 years in America to get to 11 trillion debt. It took us only uh, four years to get to another 11 trillion in debt in the last four years. It simply can't stop the fact that we have 210 trillion in liabilities, 109 trillion in assets. We are a banana republic balance sheet, and we're the home of the world reserve currency. So whatever we do, and four percent would certainly be easier than six percent or five and three quarters percent. But whatever we do. We can't get around the reality of our debt. We've tried to come up with backdoor QE through all kinds of tricks with the TGA account, with the reverse repo markets, uh, with BTFP, even with Fred and Fa Fred and Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac trying to give more you know, leverage opportunities, even the BIS coming with more leverage opportunities, BTFP, all these things we've been doing to give direct or indirect, uh, indirect liquidity to the system, we're just running out of fire hoses. And eventually it'll probably go to direct QE and that just means the debasement of, of, of our currency, which again explains why gold hit all time highs this year and is just beginning the second or third or fourth chapter of a much larger book. Uh, on the gold price, because the U.S. dollar is never going to be replaced. I don't believe that. I don't think the ruble or the yuan are going to come in as a new reserve currency. I don't even think the BRICS are going to have a gold-backed BRICS currency. I just think gold's going to take more and more of a role, which the BIS has already admitted, the IMF has already admitted, the markets have already seen, the oil markets are seen. So it's just that not that the dollar will be replaced, it's going to be repriced, because we can't afford a stronger dollar. The, the euro dollar markets can't afford a stronger dollar. The European banks can't afford a stronger dollar. I love Brent Johnson. He could be right. He's very brilliant. His thesis of, this, of the milkshake theory came out in 2019. He said he knew it was true because it didn't feel good to know it was true because it was so appalling that a dollar this, this debased could still be this strong because of euro dollar demand, derivative demand, SWIFT system. What I'm saying, yeah, that was true in 2019, but post-2022, post-weaponization, post the BRICS rise, and post this disaster, the dollar's changed. And, and even the BIS has made gold a tier one asset because the truth is the world wants an asset that, that doesn't lose its value and can't be stolen from you at will. And uh, there's no coincidence that what we're seeing beyond the BIS, what we're seeing with the BRICS, what we're seeing with the repatriation of gold, which no one is talking about, what we're seeing in the oil markets everywhere, gold is the obvious new direction. That's not a gold bug case. It's not because gold got suddenly sexy. It's because the dollar is becoming too big to, you know, too big to be, it's too big to succeed. It has to, we need a weaker dollar. And again, it goes back to your question, 4% would be better than 6%. I think the only reason we haven't is really in a lot of ways because Jerome Powell is so human, he's afraid to just admit he got it 100% wrong. Thomas Hernig is not afraid to say that they're wrong. But Powell's the guy in the big chair and he's human. And I think he's afraid to admit defeat. Should the U.S. president have a say over monetary policies? <laughs> if a U.S. president could actually read math and count to 10, yeah. Uh, right now, it's hairstyles and, and pundit speeches and popularity that have replaced actual sound thinking. And that's, you know, I'm an equal opportunist cynic. Um, <laughs> so it's not just trying to take a pen. People say, Matt, take a stand, you know, be, be Republican, be Democrat. The truth is, I haven't seen good financial leadership in so long. Um, you know, it, I wrote a I wrote an article, I think it was last week, called The Template of Lies, the bond markets and, and Joe Biden. It's not to be mean to Joe Biden, but look, this is not news to anyone. I mean, you know, Joe Biden's mental decline was clear. They tried to conceal that for years. I think it was three years ago he went to the Democrat House Caucus. Joe Biden went to talk to his own party. He stumbled and mumbled so badly three years ago that everyone said, what did he just say? No one could understand what he was saying. He never came back. President of the United States never went back to his caucus for three years. 
Meanwhile, all the concealers in chief, from his press secretary to his vice president, tried to tell us and the media that there was nothing wrong with Joe Biden. And then suddenly overnight, it implodes recently this in the last couple of months. And he's out of the he's out of the race. That was not a surprise. It shouldn't it should have been more honestly discussed. In other words, we just kept the truth out of the out of the out of the headlines for three years. It's the same thing with our bond market. Can a president have authority over over the Fed? Te technically, the Fed's an independent branch. It's not even a branch of the government, but it is a fourth branch of the government. It's an independent agency. Of course, it's not independent. It's completely tied to the hip of U.S. politics. And central bankers are just politicians. But in the same way, we've been lying about Biden's mental health, regardless of whether you're pro or negative Trump, you can't deny that Biden had some cognitive issues. Uh, even Democrats are making jokes about his resting 25th Amendment face. But again, without poking fun at Biden, what the larger issue there is a template of dishonesty and omission and lies. And we've been doing the same thing with the bond market and this, uh, this belief that the bond market made sense. Jeffrey Goodlack, I'm quoting him, not me, said you have to be stupid to buy a 10 year bond. No one sees it because you're never going to beat inflation reported or misreported as it is. And, you know, Lou Groman calls the bond market blood sport. But even the BIS right, came out with its annual letter, which nobody reads. And the BIS finally said what we've been warning for years, like Biden's mental health for years, which no one wanted to admit. BIS said when debt levels reach a point of, of slope and speed higher than growth levels, sovereign bonds go down, not up, which means interest rates go up, not down, because yields go up, not down. And we've been saying this for years. It's suddenly they're acting like this is news, like Biden's mental state is suddenly news. And we've all seen it. If you're looking into your question, can a leader, a president, um, certainly you could argue that Trump is more economically savvy than Joe Biden. But again, I understand that that's not going to make everyone happy. But look, it doesn't matter, as I've said many times, if Papa Smurf is in the White House or at the Fed. You're not going to be able to fix this now. It's too late. We're going to have to have massive austerity, massive spending cuts, or... To Brent Johnson's point, the dollar can end violently or militarily. And sadly, that is a direction I think we're going. Again, I don't know what a war looks like with Russia or China over Taiwan or with Israel and Iran in a nuclear age. I'm not an expert on that. It's, it's to me madness. It's madness. But again, I'm not an expert on that. But it's either massive spending cuts and in, in, entitlements in the military, which is politically difficult, or Social Security, almost political suicide, or... It's it's massive monetization and currency debasement or both. Um, and I don't know if any president is willing to tell the truth like Harvey or Malay is to come out in public and say, we are so freaking broke. We are so fat in bureaucracy. We're so fat in spending. We've got to cut, cut, cut with a chainsaw and get real. His population would listen because by that point they were on their knees. Is the American population ready to believe a president that says we're we're bankrupt. We're a banana republic. We've got major problems with our debt and our interest expenses and our economy and our markets and the wealth division, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got to face this as a country. You may be able to get elected saying that, uh, maybe, but will, will a population choose? I don't know. They have to trust the leader to ask not what their country can do for them, but what they can do for their country. They have to trust their leader to make sacrifices. Americans have made sacrifices many times throughout history when they believed in their country and they believed in their leadership. The truth is red or blue, you know, left or right or middle, no one believes consensusly in our leadership right now. Whoever wins in November, half the country is going to be furious and distrustful. And, uh, you know, you've got Ray Dalio talking about a 50 percent chance of civil war. Elon Musk, as you and I discussed, thinks it's inevitable. That's hard to imagine. I, I really don't know. I could see secession, not like 1861 and, you know, Manassas and Gettysburg. I can just see certain states peeling off and saying we're going to do this ourselves. Maybe. But again, these are fantastic thoughts to think about. And uh, as an American who lives overseas, half my life in one country, half my life in another continent, it can be easier to be objective, as you know. But it can also be impossible to predict. But I can say this. I've never seen my country, the U.S., more divided, more polarized, more broke and more poorly misled, whether it's in the State Department, the Fed or the White House. It is an unrecognizable country to me in massive decline. And I think that's pretty obvious to the world. And then, then we can go into Germany. We can go into Frankfurt. We can go into Liverpool. There's things happening all around and in France, too. So it's a weird time, Kai. Let's just be honest. But it's, it's not surprising to me that it's, it's really driven by debt. This is the this is kind of the the, the template, you know, of, 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 of a falling empire. You know, you get this period of debt, then decadence, whether it's celebrity chefs or tw transgender bathrooms, then you get social unrest, then you get centralization and war. And, and uh, sadly, we're seeing all of that right now.
is there a way to break out that death? Let's call it the death spiral. Is there mm-hmm. a way? Like, is there a way for everybody to sit down, and sing Kumbaya together again? Is there is there a way? Like, without getting too ideological, obviously, but is there a way? Do you see a solution? Is there even one? Or do we really need, you know, wipe the slate clean, meaning we need a war, we need something to happen, drast- something drastic to happen to, yeah. to start from zero? Well, I mean, this is something a lot of people are talking about right now. There's going to be, there's there's three or four different options. There could be a kumbaya. We got a great leader who's speaking honest to me, speaking honest to us. We all, as a, generally as a country, believe in him. We're willing to make sacrifices. We're going to tighten our belt. We're going to go through years and years of austerity. We're going to cut some spending. We're going to cut some progress. We're going to cut our military. That's pretty unlikely to me. The other possibility is some type of plaza accord or Bretton Woods 2.0, where countries come together and they reset the chairs on the deck of the Titanic and try to come up with a. I'm not going to say a debt jubilee or debt forgiveness, but a restructuring. Probably more likely is a revaluation of gold because that would solve some problems. It doesn't mean a gold-backed currency, but a revaluation of a new net settlement uh, currency or a new net settlement asset, which is already happening. Uh, Or we could have war. Or we could have war and then blame everything on the war. We all suffer collectively in the war. Wars can be short-term, very stimulative on markets and the economy because war economies are great. But Willow Run Airport in Michigan in the 1940s making B-24 bombers is very different than 2024 in a hot war with a major nuclear power. I, I don't see how that works. But it's either massive austerity, some type of global reset, which would require the BRICS to cooperate with the G7, which is not happening, in my opinion, or war. Um, and already the IMF is telegraphing you know, central bank digital currency. They use the, the COVID hysteria to, to kind of plant that seed that because COVID was as bad as World War II, which of course it was not, that's insulting to anyone in Europe or anyone in America who has relatives who fought in that war. It's an insulting comparison. But they were already telegraphing that COVID would require a new CBDC, which would have to be backed by a real asset to give it credibility, which would be gold. So that, that works for gold, but I don't like central bank digital currencies. But it is some type of reset blamed on something other than the fact that the bathroom mirrors of our politicians and central bankers put us in this place. They created social unrest. They created wealth inequality. They created inflationary asset bubbles. They created they created this disaster, but they're going to have a war to blame on or COVID to blame it on, do some type of reset, which will probably be backed by a real asset like gold. I just see that. Or worse, Kai, we have war. So it's austerity, reset, or war, uh, or some combination of the three. And again, that sounds madness to me because I really, you know, as you know, in Germany or I know in France, you go to any little village, the cemeteries are riddled with names of young people. And those were 1914, 1939 wars, which were appalling, tens and tens of millions, generations missing. But in a nuclear era, I don't know how we use war as a solution. I don't think a military solution makes any sense, but that's my bias. No, no I'm with you there. It's like, Given you know the information we have, and uh, you know just just looking at this, everything's in here, and we we're still fighting for religious wars and things yeah. like that. It's like mind blowing yeah. to me. Um, I, I want to stay on politics a bit without getting political there, uh, yeah. Matthew. But uh, we've seen a lot of change in the U.S. the last three weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. Harris got announced as the new uh, candidate for the Democratic Party. She picked a VP mm-hmm. candidate as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, question now is like who's who's better for the stock market? Which ticket? Which side of the aisle? And B, because it's mm-hmm. different, who's better for the economy? Well, we're talking in really broad generalizations. Obviously, Republican and Democrats, or maybe not obvious to European listeners, but in general, the Democrats are big government. And Republicans are small government. Democrats are more regulatory. Republicans in general are less regulations, more free market. Uh, the Democrats would argue that that creates, you're ignoring the poor and the middle class. And the Republicans are arguing, no, let the economy take care of itself. Let people meritocracy their way through. So you have two very different views broadly between Democrats and Republicans. Biden famously bro- you know, bragged that he was the poorest senator because he didn't in- even invest in stocks and bonds. He was more interested in the people. That was his argument. Again, these are generalizations. Uh, generally, Republican regimes are more favorable. When Trump was in the White House his four years, he was constantly, I think, over 150 tweets talking about the markets are up because I'm in office. He measured himself by the s and So you could argue that when Trump comes in, He's going to be more favorable, more less regulatory. Tech's going to do better. Net gas is going to do better. Oil's going to do better. You know, certain industries are going to do far better under a Republican slash Trump administration than a Harris administration or what was supposed to be a Biden administration until the elections got tweaked. So those are broad statements. Again, my view, and I'll say it again, Mother Teresa, Albert Einstein, Santa Claus, left or right, isn't going to fix these problems in the next four years. I feel sorry for whoever is elected because it's like getting the someone said the other day, I think it was brilliant. 
I wouldn't want to be the captain of the Titanic after we hit the iceberg because there's nothing you can do. You can make some changes. Now, you, some many people believe Trump can end the war in the Ukraine faster and et cetera. Those are very political, sensitive topics. But again, being the captain of the Titanic after we've already hit the iceberg is going to make it very hard for whoever's in the White House next. Uh, but to your question, the generic answer is Republicans are more favorable to markets and less interested in the middle class or the lower middle class, which is ironic is I think the lower middle class under the last four years doesn't feel like the Democrats have been taking care of them either. Uh, and so in, in the U.S., the big conversations now is we've got inflation, which is killing the middle class, which is really just the working poor. We've got interest rates higher. So not only does our currency buy less, the cost of debt is increasing. And again, that's why we're seeing rising unemployment, this lagging indicator, rising bankruptcies, more and more defaults. So the Democrats haven't done a very good job of their traditional base. Let's just put it that way. You throw into that 10 to 13 million illegal immigrants coming through the door. That's not winning a lot of hearts and minds of Americans. It just isn't, whatever their politics. I don't know how you could ignore that elephant in the room because these are not the best and brightest from Latin America, Eastern Europe, or Asia coming in through Texas. And so that may sound uh, you know, phobic about immigration. No, these are not immigrants that came into America in the 1820s, the 1880s. These are not here to make America better. They're here to get a handout or to do something more nefarious. Not every one of them, of course, but in general, when you have 18 million come to the door, there's room for a lot of slippage. And what we're seeing with the fentanyl crisis, what we're seeing with murder rates, what we're seeing with, with, with the immigration backlash is not a surprise. And that shouldn't be seen as a racist comment. That's a realist comment. My first class in law school is if you have a lifeboat and you kick somebody off the lifeboat to save the other people in the lifeboat, is that really murder? No, it's a crime. It's a defensive necessity. Our lifeboat in America, like the lifeboat in the UK or the lifeboat in Frankfurt, can only take so much, or the lifeboat in Sweden. That doesn't mean you're cruel to immigrants if you're realistic about what you can absorb and what you can't absorb and what's going on between afghanistan the immigration problem the middle class the inflation again it sounds like i'm making a republican trump speech i'm not i'm just saying <laughs> there's nothing very successful about the last four years so harris versus trump look who knows but i'm saying it doesn't even matter to me in a lot of ways It'll, that'll upset a lot of people but trump can't save it they can't save the titanic harris i certainly don't think can save it the problem with Harris, too, and again, this will upset every Democrat listening, she wasn't really elected. She was selected by the DNC. There is a sense that that's not democracy. I mean, she didn't get any delegates when she ran against Biden four years ago. Now, suddenly, she's the one. I think there are a lot of Democrats that I've talked to who said, can't we do better than this? There are a lot of Republicans who wish we could do something better than Trump. I'm just saying, uh, Rick Rule said it in Vancouver, and I think it was with you. We were, we were talking about this. That's the best choice that America with you know 300 million plus people come up with this. And I was at a conference. Uh, I was talking to someone from the British Parliament who came up and said, "Well, you've got a choice between the what was it the the uh, the deranged and the incompetent or something." But now we've got Harris coming in. So, look, I'm not a political pundit. People don't want my political views, but we all agree that America is more broke, more divided, more polarized than ever, and our our, our central bank is is more trapped than ever, and 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 our debt levels are unsustainable. Uh, and that that economics does become political, right? Because when you stand out in the rain long enough, you'll get in anyone's car. And when you're that desperate, you'll want to believe anyone can save you. But I don't think we're seeing that Javier Malay like honesty from the left or the right about just how fragile our markets and our economy really are. And when you add on to that, the social unrest that always follows from currency debasement, because the real issue isn't transgender bathrooms, left versus right, black versus white. To me, I used to think that. I think the real issue is economic. And when people can't get through the month or the week, they become very political. And they'll believe just about anyone who tells them what they want to hear or blame anyone they think they can blame when the real problem, honestly, is our economy. It's the economy, stupid. And that the fact is that people are really, really struggling. I listen to a lot, a lot of stuff from Luke Groman. I think he's brilliant. He's from Ohio. I'm from Michigan. You know, We got into the markets, went on, did our fancy lives, but I've never forgotten my Midwestern roots. I've never forgotten my German grandparents. They taught us history. They taught us hard work. They taught us those, these realities. But we also know that things can go from sublime to ridiculous very fast. But usually it's because of bankers and policy and politicians who didn't understand that you can't spend three and a half times more than you earn. And, and call that a success story. And you can't solve that with one credit card after the next, which is basically what we're doing until eventually you got to blame somebody else other than your own debt addiction. And uh, again, it's, it's a sad time in America. It's clear, regardless of your politics, we all agree that things are very, very divided in the United States. 
Yeah. Uh, Matthew, you're having a hard time finding a good segue to gold. You brought it up a few times uh, in, in your answers, but I, I don't have a clear-cut question to, to cut to gold. Yeah. But uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show this chart. And let's see if that worked. There it is. And that's the last week's chart, or this week's chart, actually. We're, mm -hmm. we're here on Friday morning. We're recording. Monday, gold dropped almost $100, about 90 bucks. Do yep. you think gold fulfilled its role uh, during the, the, the Black Monday of August 5th? Uh, yeah, this it's a very important question. The short answer is yes. I mean, the volatility we saw and everything else was was off the charts, and the VIX to the to the futures and the and the Nasdaq certainly the Nikkei, and certainly compared to Bitcoin. That said, and I've, we've always agreed that gold is very sympathetic in a market sell off. Everything goes down in a, in a in a lower tide, but comparatively, it did far better. I, I never look at gold day to day or month to month frankly even quarter to quarter because i'm looking at it a much more longer term trends there's this guy henrik zeberg i think out of scandinavia who says gold's going to go way down in the next market crash like it did in 2008. uh again i could be wrong i'm certainly biased in favor of gold i think we all are and we're watching this and certainly you and i are but let's play the lawyer here and look at both cases you could argue on the the negative case that gold is just another asset class that tanks when the tide goes out and it's sympathetic to the markets but even if that were true, even if you take the 08 template, it rebounded much faster than everything else. Gold, as we all know, can be used when 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 you need when you need to make a margin or you need to pay for um, the losses in your bad investments. You sell off your good investments. That may sound like an apology for gold, <clears throat> but more importantly, I think 2024 is very very different than 2008. And we can get into all the kind of technical charts. We can get into all the comps historically. But let's let's keep it, I think, relatively simple because the the simple stupid is so simple right now. And these are things that aren't making the headlines, but are absolutely massive in favor of where gold's longer term direction is going. And, and I think the most one of the most obvious is just the Bank of International Settlements. Not my favorite place to be, not my favorite people. Uh, if, you, if, you, if we did a show just on what the BAS does, it would make people very nervous. And they're immune from prosecution, immune from taxation. They live very well doing a lot of bad things. But even the BAS, they're pol politics. They're political and they know what they see the right on the wall with the U.S. dollar. And just last year, which very few people understood, the BIS made gold a tier one asset. The only other tier one asset in the BIS is the U.S. Treasury. Why did that happen? It's not a coincidence because the BIS knows what the BRICs know, that no one wants to use the dollar anymore, the U.S. Treasury, as a reserve asset. It's a liquidity asset. But to save and store value, gold has just been elevated to a tier one asset. OK, that's very important headline in and of itself for the longer term direction of gold, not the chart that happened in the week of August 5th. The other obvious thing is Eastern Central Banks. Again, since 2014, no one's been noticing Eastern Central Banks in general have been net selling U.S. Treasuries and net buying gold at historical records. Again, why? Why are they dumping U.S. Treasuries and buying gold and then increasing that since 2022 when we weaponized the dollar and took the FX reserves away from a major power like Russia, which is in bed with China and selling oil back and forth to each other in Yuan? Why is that happening? It's not a coincidence that the world and the central banks, watch what they do, not what the pundits say, are dumping treasuries and stacking gold. You've got 30 nations in the last year and a half who've been repatriating gold out of the COMEX and the LBMA banks. Why? Because it's a tier one asset. They don't want it in London or New York on those exchanges. They want it at home. Why? Because gold is becoming far more important as a net settlement trade asset. And so you've also got the COMEX and the LBMA banks seeing massive outflows of physical delivery because people don't want to play the churn and extend game. They want their physical assets. You've got 45 nations trading outside the US dollar. That's not going to change the FX power of the US dollar overnight but it's a clear and obvious trend away from the US dollar. You've got the oil trade trading more and more outside of the petrodollar. Again, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, they're pegged to the dollar. They don't want to see the dollar die, but they are moving away from the dollar. The UAE, UAE and Saudi just joined the BRICS and they're making deals with other countries to sell outside of the petrodollar. It has a massive impact on the US dollar. No one is really talking about that. The rise of the Shanghai exchange is now it's the third largest exchange behind the COMEX and the LBMA banks. And even the IMF, the IMF, and along with the BIS, are already, again, talking about using gold to back the, the, the new central bank digital currency that they're going to try and unleash when things really hit the fan. These massive movements have shown, again, to Brent Johnson, I agree, the dollar will be the last to fall. I don't see it going to 150. And it will fall violently and militarily, but that's already happening because the milkshake theory came out in 2019. I think my theory came out in 2022. Things are changing. Watch what the world is doing, not what they're saying. Again, I've used this analogy militarily. 
if the if the army of northern virginia is crossing the potomac on their way to gettysburg and you're there and you're witnessing it that army is coming not to discuss politics not to have tea and crumpets they're coming to go to war so you have to react to that movement of that army coming across well look at the world is doing look what the BRICS are doing look what the bis is saying look what the imf is saying look what the petrodollar is doing look what the what's happening in the comex and the lbma markets they're all preparing because they see that army marching across the river they're stocking up they're loading up in gold because that is going to be the new reserve asset it already is under the bis's terms it's already is under the BRICS actions it already is even in the gold in the gulf oil states and, and the price of oil is far more stable when there's gold backing than which is dollar back so it's not even anymore in the best interest it's not going to happen overnight but it's already happening quickly these are the longer term trends kai they're so obvious and not gold bug sensational that aren't being discussed by the Fed naturally or by Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan or even Credit Suisse, because there's, we can get into that, there's a vested interest in not seeing gold rise. But again, get away from the daily charts. This is not an apology for gold's down moves. Of course, it doesn't move in a straight line, but look at the historical charts, look at the longer term trend. Gold can go sideways for years and then rip north. And to Rick Rule's point, it will reward extravagantly and frequently, but extravagantly. But look at history more than daily charts. If you're an investor, looking at five or 10 years instead of five or 10 minutes in a tweet, gold is very obviously if obvious. If you're a trader or a speculator, God bless you. I respect that. I was a trader and a speculator. It makes money. If you know how to do it well, God bless you. But for investors and for family offices or high net worth or middle class that are thinking longer term to protect themselves against the open death of their purchasing power of their currency, gold's longer term trend is up and to the right. So if you're looking at a window of more than three weeks or three months and you're thinking long term, the trend for gold and the actions, not the words, but the actions of the gold market speaks so loudly that my biggest fear right now, Kai, is I have too much conviction in gold. It makes me too confident. I've never, as a lawyer thinking left and right or both sides of the argument, I've never been this confident about an asset class longer term. The short term moves, I mean, again, we have clients in 90 countries, Kai, they never call us whether gold's at an all time highs or retracing. They never call us to ask about the gold price because they invest in gold as a wealth preservation asset. Also, by the way, it outperformed the S&P total return in the last 24 years. Doesn't make the headlines either. Even as an optionality for return, it's outperformed year. But that's ex-dividends, I think. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> but it's still, we don't look at though as a as a speculative asset we look at it as currency insurance for openly dying currency longer term and the world the bas the imf the BRICS, china russia saudi arabia they're all looking at gold too don't underestimate why and don't underestimate the implications behind that and if you think the us dollar is immortal you're right it is immortal it's not going to die the british pound sterling sterling didn't die you know the, the prior world of currencies didn't die they just got weaker and repriced and i think gold is going to be revalued I know it is. It already is. Um, but the daily moves, I'm not trying to be flippant or to ignore the question. I'm being honest. I don't care about the daily moves. I don't care about the daily moves because I'm looking at the historical moves and I'm looking at the historical death of the U.S. dollar and other fiat currencies since we decoupled from gold in 1971. It is an historical fact that they've lost greater than 95 percent of their purchasing power when measured against gold. I look at gold as a reserve asset, a savings asset. I look at the U.S. dollar as a spending asset. If I need liquidity, Dollar's king. If I look at purchasing power and, and, and reserve status, gold is king. And I'd rather have a crown of gold than a crown of paper. So I save in gold and I spend in dollars or francs or, or euros, depending on where I am. Now, Matthew, allow me last question. Is, is gold being weaponized? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, in a way, yes, because the dollar was weaponized in the first quarter of 2022. And the reaction was by the rest of the world that's been sick of being uh, having the dollar be the tail that wags their sovereign dogs, whether that's in, in China, whether that's in Russia, whether that's in India, whether that's in Venezuela, whether in any of these BRICS nations, or frankly, even Saudi Arabia. Uh, by the way, you can't call Saudi Arabia, which is your ally, a pariah state and expect them to want to keep, keep the petrodollar going for another 50 years. But gold is being weaponized in, in a way because that signal that came over the river, that first gunshot, from the absolutely stupid U.S. State Department and White House at that time, and the West and NATO. Again, I'm not going to get into politics about whether Zelensky's George Washington 2.0 or whether Putin is Hitler. I don't want to live in Shanghai or Russia. I'm not a pro-Putinist. But weaponizing the world reserve currency is something John Maynard Keynes, Robert Triffin, everyone warned against, and we did it anyway. 
Uh, and when we weaponize the world reserve currency in 2022, of course, when you send that bullet one way, there's going to be bullets coming the other way. And the bullets coming the other way right now are hopefully for now just financial and not nuclear. But the bullets coming the other way are very simple. OK, you're going to weaponize. You're going to you're going to be able to take an asset away at will. An asset, by the way, which is losing value because you're debt soaked shotgun. You're shooting. Uh, you're weaponizing this dollar. You're broke. You're taking things away from us. And you're giving us this choice to hold in U.S. Treasuries, which are losing to inflation and losing value every day. I think I'm going to use, a, you know, an asset that has infinite duration and finite supply. I'm going to I'm going to replace that. I'm going to use that gold over something that has a finite duration and infinite supply. The U.S. Treasury. I think my gold holds its value far better than U.S. Treasury. So the world is now stacking gold. That's not an argument. That is a mathematical empirical fact. Again, look what the world is doing. So in a way. Gold is being defended. It is being used as a defense against a weaponized U.S. dollar. And as I said in 2022, when I wrote How the West Was Lost, this was the day after we weaponized the dollar. I said, this is going to end badly. I wasn't alone. Grant Williams, Jim Rickards, <laughs> War College at Carlisle, Pennsylvania. saw so this was a dangerous tactic. We did it anyway because we have mental midgets thinking short term to Hernick's point instead of long term. But yeah, when we weaponized the dollar, the reaction from Russia and China and Saudi Arabia and Latin America is, we're going we're gonna to go to something else to store our value. And the Bank of International Settlements is recognizing that. The IMF is recognizing that. And so, yeah, we're defending against a weaponized dollar by building a moat of physical gold. Because we see where the hockey, the, as Wayne Gretzky would say, the hockey puck is going, not where it's sitting. I say the polo ball because I like polo, but it's a wanker sport. But the point is, the truth is, the, the, the bricks and the rest of the world are playing where the ball is headed, not where it's sitting right now. The U.S. dollar is sitting, quote unquote, pretty right now. But gold is the direction it's going. And so it is being weaponized, Kai, in a lot of ways as a defense, not as an aggression. But believe me, China and Russia, this is not plan B. They've been waiting for years as plan A to slowly de-dollarize and get away. And why do you think they're stacking gold at all-time records? So believe me, the World Gold Council is understanding of what China holds in gold or Russia holds in gold or what the U.S. holds in gold because we haven't had an audit in decades is completely inaccurate. That may sound sensational. Be very careful when the world slowly then then suddenly, like Biden's mental state, slowly then suddenly becomes obvious. Be very careful when gold, not just by the BIS or the IMF, as a reserve asset, as a tier one asset, becomes the, the core reserve asset. And again, it already is happening. It's not even something I'm predicting. It's happening as we speak. It's happening right now. And that's the direction of the hockey puck. That's how you play hockey. You go where it's going. I'm going to gold because that's where it's been going for years. 2022 just accelerated that pace. And again, not the end of the dollar, just a repriced dollar. It's exactly what the, the gold price chart looks like. It looks actually like a hockey stick. So it really works. <laughs> the analogy really, really works well there, Matthew. Yeah. Matthew, like I think we can agree gold is going to go higher. The question is what's going to devalue to, to push gold higher as well, perceivedly. So I'm curious mm -hmm. uh, you know, where we're going to end the year as well. I'm not going to ask you for a gold price prediction. That's an mm -hmm. unfair question. But mm -hmm. uh, I think we can agree, like based on what we discussed, gold is trending higher. Trends yeah, I mean, look, and look, again, this is nothing new, but it's also ignored the oil markets. Uh, look, oil is moving away from the dollar, not overnight, slowly but surely. 20% last year outside of the U.S. dollar. That was unheard of prior to the weaponization of 2022. Unheard of. It's already happening. Russia, which we sanction, whatever you think of the sanctions, has a lot of oil. Their ally is China, not the U.S. China doesn't want to buy oil with U.S. treasuries and U.S. dollars. So what are they doing? China's buying oil from Russia. It doesn't hurt Russia. They're paying for it in yuan. Russia then takes that yuan to buy a lot of stuff in China that was once made in America, and then they're net settling the delta in gold. That is a template that can be replicated in, 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 in India and other countries. That is an incredibly important thing to keep in mind. The annual oil production is 15 times X the annual gold production. As gold becomes more and more a part of net settlement in the oil trade, you just do the math. The supply and demand there is massive. Also, to Rick Rule's point and many others, 40-year mean for gold, mean reversion, is a 2% holding. Right now, it's about 0.5% of the smart money holds gold. If we just have a reversion to the mean to 2% or 4 or 5% allocation just by supply and demand, gold rips. If you don't believe in supply and demand, that's fine. But if you don't believe in that, I, I don't know what to say. Also, if you don't believe in mean reversion down in the markets and up in gold, look at the movement of gold right now in the world that we just talked about, all those string sites of examples. It's, it's just the direction of the hockey puck. And so, again, that is a long-term thinking. For me, five, 10 years is not that long-term, but I'm thinking about my purchasing power and my legacy for my kids. Powell is not thinking about the legacy of his country and the next generation. I wrote another article about that 
three or four weeks ago how we've screwed the next generation. We have. Others have said, smarter than me, that we must not love our grandchildren the way we're managing our policies. But, you know, personally, uh, you know, gold, I'm thinking long term. I don't lose sleep over it. I outperform the S&P for years. I don't lose sleep over it. I don't make fun of speculators trying to go out on that risk branch for yield or for people looking at NVIDIA and trying to make a return. I, I understand the need to speculate, especially when you're really stressed financially. Just be very, very careful about the signals, because like Biden's mindset publicly, it can go all it can go slowly, then all at once, as, as Hemingway described poverty. Be realistic. Don't have to be gloom and doom. Don't have to hug your knees. Don't have to put 100 percent into gold. Be honest, be informed, challenge my thoughts, challenge Luke Roman thoughts, challenge Ray Dalio's thoughts, challenge Jeffrey Gunlack or Jeremy Grantham. We're all in different fields, but we all agree. Markets are going to mean revert south unless they're monetized by a Fed, which means you've destroyed the currency, and gold's going to reverse north. A mean reverse, mean reverse north. Mean reversion is the most powerful force in the markets. Very few people understand it. Just get informed, challenge, check, question, inform yourself. And that's exactly what we're doing, and that's exactly what we've done the last 58 minutes here. Matthew, phen phenomenal yeah. conversation. Really appreciate it. Like, I could talk with you for hours, and you know that. And we've done I that. I never shut up. That's why. Right. <laughs> oh, it's, it, I love listening as well. Like, I don't mind yeah. just sitting here having you on, on the full screen. So, really, yeah. really appreciate your time. Where can we follow a bit more of your work here, Matthew? Yeah, um, we're at vongrayers.gold or vg.gold. And finally, goldswitzerland.com. We were Matterhorn for many years uh, just because Egon von Greyers, our founding partner, is such an important part of our legacy and such an important part of our current operations. We kind of wanted the name to reflect the the integrity and the values of our founder. So um, all of my interviews and articles, all of Egon's interviews, Ronnie Sturfla throws a lot of articles. He's an advisor. So we, we get a lot of help from, from Grant Williams and Ronnie Sturfla's advisors. They're brilliant. Um, but we can be found at vg.gold. Uh, we write a lot about, obviously, why you should look at gold. But we also write about the bond markets. We look at yields. We look at other things and other risk assets, me in particular. But I think most importantly, um, we, we write about not just why you should own gold, but how you should own it, how not to own it, in particular, not at a commercial bank and certainly not in an ETF if you're an investor, if you're looking for long-term preservation. And, uh, so all that's for free. Our minimums are not for everyone. We understand that. But our message is for everyone. Anyone can go there and look at the articles, look at the Why Gold page and get an education. It's certainly a biased education, Kai, but it's full of conviction. We have this conviction. Uh, and yeah. uh, that, that's, that's our bias. Phenomenal. Matthew, really, really appreciate your time. Trying to keep it under an hour so the YouTube right. algorithm doesn't punish us. No, no, okay. really appreciate it, Matthew. Thank you so much for your time. I, I can't wait to do this again soon and uh, catch up maybe more closer to the U.S. Uh, elections as well, Super. see when there is a clearer trend. Super. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate you watching. Hope you enjoyed this. Leave a comment, leave a like, subscribe to the channel. It is much appreciated. Thank you so much. We'll be back with lots more here on Smart Financial.